For the very first video on this channel, I decided to cover the one and only the Monte Cristo homestead, the most haunted house in Australia. I have been fascinated by this place for years now, so when I began my research, I thought I already knew most of what there was to know about the Monte Cristo. I was wrong. So much has happened on this property, and in my own opinion, I feel like the Monte Cristo homestead is Australia's version of the Westminster Mystery House in the US. Both homes were built a year apart from each other by very wealthy people whose lives were riddled with tragedy. Now, both of these beautiful homes are popular tourist attractions that are famous for their many, many ghosts. I just hope that if somebody decides to make a movie about the Monte Cristo homestead, it's better than the Westminster movie. I think this is going to be a long video, so you should go put your kettle on, get comfy, and grab that emotional support pillow because this is about to get spooky. The Monte Cristo homestead was built in 1885 for a Mr. Christopher William Crawley. Located five hours drive southwest of Sydney in the country town of Juni. To put this time into perspective, 1885 Australia was a very different place than it is today. It was 96 years after first European settlement, 16 years before Federation, and 16 years before we saw our first automobile. Australia was not a nation yet, but a continent consisting of six British colonies, each with their own government and laws. And at this point of time, the frontier wars were still ongoing. Juni at this time was a very small town that was only established a few years prior and mostly consisted of farmland until the main south line came into town. The main south line is a railway line connecting Sydney to Melbourne and it was built right through the middle of Juni. And upon doing so, the population of Juni began to grow. Christopher Crawley was a businessman who made his fortune from being one of the first to capitalize on the new surge of tourism brought into Juni by train. He bought all the land on either side of Juni station and on the west side he built the railway hotel which became the popular resting place for travelers and staff. As the town grew he was very reluctant to sell off any of his land. He only parted with some small pieces at hugely inflated prices. Eventually though, he did sell off his land, including his hotel, and it is with those earnings that he then went off to build the now infamous the Monte Cristo homestead. Crawley was a devout Catholic, and it is said that he built his home on top of a high hill where he could look down upon the town that he helped build, but to also be closer to God. The literal meaning of Monte Cristo is Mount of Christ. In 1885, the main construction of the Monte Cristo was complete. A two-story Victorian mansion made from the finest materials of the time. Also on the property was Crawley's original home, now converted into the living quarters for the servants. Later, as his wealth grew, Crawley also added a stable outback to hold his prized racehorses. His wife, Mrs. Elizabeth Crawley, who was also a devout Catholic, moved into the home where she went on to have many children. Their names are Helen, Lydia, Florence, Angela, Mervyn, Aubrey, and Alphonse. However, in my research, it seems like people aren't entirely sure about how many children the Crawleys actually had. The official website says that they have seven children. However, I have found footage of the current owners of the home talking about their youngest daughter, Magdalene, who is not on this list on their website. I think there are a few reasons for this, which I will get into later. Being a wealthy family, all the Crawley children were sent away to be educated at the most prestigious boarding schools. Now, reputations and appearances were very important to the Crawley family, and although Mr. Crawley, on the surface, may have seemed like a respectable gentleman, it was apparently common knowledge around town that Mr. Crawley had fathered at least 10 more children to his maids. 
His maids consisted of young girls aged from 13 to 15 years old. Mr. Crawley's house staff knew him and his wife to be harsh and brutal taskmasters. Elizabeth was known to rule the house with an iron rod and treated her staff terribly. With the many pregnancies of Mr. Crawley's illegitimate children came many births. Births that had to be hidden. Mrs. Crawley would have the maids give birth at the Monte Cristo with no doctor or midwife present, making the other maids assist with the delivery all on their own. Sadly, it is believed that at least one maid and child died at childbirth in one of the bedrooms. This barbarism is not forgotten by the ghosts of the Monte Cristo, especially not by two of the most active ghosts on the property, the Morris Boy and Harold Steele. The Morris Boy, also known as the Stable Boy, is said to be one of the most active ghosts on the property. He worked for the Crawleys as a stable hand and suffered an excruciating death at a young age by the hands of the stable master. Story goes he was sick and he couldn't get out of bed. His master claimed that he was just pretending. So he lit the boy's bed on fire with a match. The boy's bed was made entirely out of hay. The boy then suffered third degree burns all over his body and he then died a few weeks later. It is believed that he was somewhere between the age of nine to 11 years old. On the Australian television program, The Believers, Australian medium Kerry Wearing claims the reason why the boy could not leave his bed was because of the injuries from a previous brutal whipping he received by the stable master. And what I'm getting is, in our, in our day, he didn't do anything but be a normal kid, you know? But he suffered some, I'm getting the words, intolerable cruelty. And what I'm being shown is after the beating, he didn't recover, and it wasn't too long after that that he passed away. Today, the Morris boy haunts the coach house located behind the Monte Cristo, which is said to be the most haunted place on the property. Visitors regularly claim to have seen a young boy walk through walls inside the stable, and parents claim their children tell stories of playing with a little boy dressed in period clothing that no one else can see. Team WSPR, an Australian paranormal research and investigation team, discuss and capture many of the strange occurrences in the homestead in their two-part podcast conducted on the property. In part two of their podcast, they show some compelling evidence they captured trying to contact the Morris boy. Harold Steele was the son of one of the caretakers employed by the Crawleys. He was mentally disabled and lived in a time where there really wasn't much education or understanding towards those like him. Harold's mother would chain him to the wall of her room and left him alone all day and night until she returned from her daily duties. One day staff realized they had not seen his mother in several days. That's when they found Harold's mother dead. She had died in her sleep several days before. And Harold, now severely malnourished, was found cradling his mother's body. Harold was 40 years old. And with nobody to care for him, they sent him away to a mental institution, where he then died a few days later. Harold's chains still remain on the walls of his room today as well as the marks in the wall from where the chain would rub up against the wall from him walking back and forth all day long. Visitors say to have heard his chains clanking on their own. It is believed that Harold's ghost now wanders the grounds, finally free. Tragedy was no stranger to the Crawleys either with the death of their youngest daughter, Magdalene. 
When Mrs. Crawley was away from home, she left her baby Magdalene under the care of her staff. Magdalene then somehow fell down the stairs and then died of her injuries, which included a twisted bow. This baby girl was then left abandoned on the floor for two hours. Mrs. Crawley then returned home to find her daughter at the bottom of the stairs, untouched by anyone. Magdalene then died in her mother's arms at only 14 months old. So the question remains, where were the staff who were left to care for her? How can a small child be forgotten or left alone for so long with a house full of people? Was this a twisted act of revenge committed by the staff, sick of the daily abuse from the Crawleys? Or was there something even more sinister residing at the Monte Cristo? Now, there is some confusion about exactly who died and how many died on that staircase, as there is another story of a young girl's death on the stairs. Ethel, supposedly another one of the Crawley's children not listed on the official website. It is possible that they only listed the children that survived. Ethel was in the arms of her nanny when her nanny claims something pushed Ethel out of her arms and down the stairs. Ethel was only 10 months old when she died and the nanny swore from then on, even on her deathbed, that something, some unseen force pushed baby Ethel out of her arms. Was there already a paranormal presence at the Monte Cristo when the Crawleys were still alive? Was it attached to the land? Was the Monte Cristo doomed from the very beginning? Is it possible that these children were not Elizabeth Crawley's children, but her husband's, and that is why their names are not listed? Were Magdalene and Ethel murdered, or were their deaths both tragic accidents? I also have the theory that maybe Magdalene's death was actually caused by one of the younger Crawley children. You know, children could have been playing around the stairs and an accident happened, but that still begs the question, where were the adults? Why did nobody touch her? Why was she just abandoned there for two hours? I, I, don't, I don't think we'll ever have the answers to those questions. Guests today at the homestead claim to experience dizziness on the top of the stairs and report the feeling of a sinister presence. Children also become agitated on or around the staircase. It is also common for grown men to start weeping in the house, claiming they feel the presence of a small child or baby and have intense feelings of heaviness and melancholy. Last, but certainly not least, probably the most well-known death to happen on the property, and one you really cannot miss, is that of the mysterious white lady, spotted and commonly heard pacing the upstairs balcony. If you were to come to visit the Monte Cristo today, you would stumble upon evidence of her death before even entering the home. On the steps of the mansion, there is a large white stain. This stain was apparently created by the bleach used to clean off the pool of blood from the head-on collision of a woman falling off the front balcony. Now, the Crawleys claim that this woman took her own life by jumping off the front balcony. However, the location of the stain indicating the point of impact does not seem plausible with an apparent suicide. If someone was to launch themselves from the balcony, you would expect them to land further out, missing the front steps completely. But the stain is directly below the balcony railing. One theory is that this was in fact a murder committed by Mr. Crawley upon finding out he had impregnated another woman and was trying to cover up the evidence. Another theory states that this could have been a result of an accident committed by one of the Crawley's own sons. When he learnt that this woman was pregnant 
with a child conceived outside of wedlock. He hatched a plan to try and induce miscarriage by hanging her by her ankles off the front balcony, but his hand slipped and she fell to her death. All evidence of this crime was then cleaned away because the Crawleys had a reputation to keep. My bets are actually on the second theory, that it was the Crawley's son. The story is very detailed and being hung by the ankles makes more sense with the location of the stain. Mr. Crawley hadn't killed any of the other women he impregnated, so we think. On December 14th, 1910, at the age of 69, Mr. Crawley dies of heart failure due to blood poisoning caused by the sore on his neck, which was infected by the starch in his collar. Mrs. Crawley was immensely affected by the death of her husband and from then on only wore all black, just like the late Queen Victoria, who had died nine years before Mr. Crawley. Sometime after Mr. Crawley's death, it is reported that a woman and child died in his old bedroom due to a botched miscarriage. However, no one knows for sure who she was or if she was carrying another of Mr. Crawley's illegitimate children. Several mediums upon entering this room today report having visions of blood all over the walls and claim a young boy was murdered there. And some mediums also sense that there was another death out back of the mansion with visions of a young girl's body being dragged across the back property. Being shown um, stabbing, I'm sh seeing that. Ooh. Okay, it's like dragging a body, hiding the body. covering it up as if nothing's, um, so no one knows. And I'm getting that it's hidden truth. After her husband's death, Mrs. Elizabeth Crawley became a hermit, only leaving her house twice in the 23 years left of her life. She turned her upstairs storage room into a chapel where she prayed for an hour every day and had a local priest come every Sunday to perform sermons for her. My youngest daughter, she's seen old Mrs Crawley in the chapel on three occasions and you couldn't pay her enough money to sleep in there. Towards the end of her life, the breakfast room downstairs was converted into a bedroom as she was too weak to use the stairs. On the 12th of August, 1933, at the age of 92, after a burst appendix, Mrs. Elizabeth Crawley died of heart failure in the converted breakfast room. Today, it is said you know when Mrs. Crawley's ghost is near you, when you feel the sensation of ice cold air falling like snow upon you. And if you wear a hat inside her house, she will knock it off your head and order you out of her home. Now, just when you think there surely can't be any more deaths or strange happenings at the Monte Cristo, let me fast forward 76 years after the Monte Cristo was built and 16 years after the last of the Crawley children have left the property. The year is now 1961 and a 15 year old boy from Juni has just watched Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho in the local cinema for a third time. He comes home, he takes his father's rifle, he walks up to the Monte Cristo, goes straight to the caretaker's room and shoots him. Then in the caretaker's blood, he writes Jack, ha ha, across the door. Jack was the caretaker's name and those markings are still there today. No motive was found, the boy was arrested, the caretaker survived, but nobody wanted his job anymore. Everyone in town knew the Monte Cristo homestead was a haunted house. So then it sat abandoned for another two years. Only two. I told you this was going to be a long video. There is even a story that there is treasure buried on the property because Mr. Crawley didn't believe in banks. 
It is said he kept his fortune in gold bars and hid them somewhere on the grounds. What once was a fine building was now neglected and was not much more than a crumbling heap. The main, main house was uh, laid empty for a long time, then it got vandalised and fell to rack and ruin and laid there all through the 50s. It was always known as the haunted house and everything else. And even me as a kid, you know, we used to play up around there, but we never seemed to want to go into it or near it, but because it was, it did have that funny furling or spooky furling in there, you know, you sort of, sort of frighten you a bit. Here enters Reginald Ryan. The year is now 1963. Robert Menzies is Australia's Prime Minister. Martin Luther had a dream. And the Beatles released their first studio album. This same year, the Ryan family purchased the now dilapidated Monte Cristo homestead. Reginald had grown up in Juni and had always wanted to own his own Victorian home. And after some back and forth with the Crawley children, they finally gave in and allowed Reginald to purchase the entire property and all its buildings for a mere 1,000 pounds. Pounds were the currency of Australia at the time. Moving in with him came his heavily pregnant wife, Olive, and their three young daughters. Now, I think Olive deserves a medal for this. She was eight months pregnant. It was 1963, and her husband had just moved their whole family into a home with no electricity, no running hot water, and no doors or windows. And it already had the reputation of being haunted. Reg, mate, Jesus Christ. As well as no doors or windows, much of the finer things that once made the Monte Cristo a place to envy had been ripped out and stolen. And one thing that was destroyed that I find to be very interesting was the staircase. The exact staircase where supposedly two young girls died. The same staircase a maid swore something pushed Ethel out of her arms. The same staircase where people now report an uneasy and foreboding feeling. That staircase had been chopped up with an axe and set fire to. I know vandals are vandals and that's what they do. But I'd imagine that chopping a whole staircase up with an axe is quite a task. You'd think there had to be a reason. Obviously, someone did not want people walking on that staircase. Today, guests can use the completely restored staircase. <laughs> Thanks, Reg. Now, you're probably wondering, why would somebody want to buy this place and make it their home? Well, Reginald was not your average man. It seems that somehow he was born to own the Monte Cristo. From a young age, Reginald claims to have the same repeated dream of standing in a field of tall grass beside a large rock. As he looks up, he can see a great big Victorian home with a wraparound veranda. It was this repeated dream that inspired his passion to one day own a home just like it. So obviously Reginald was thrilled about his new purchase, but it wasn't until one day when exploring the property that he stumbled upon a great big rock, just like the one he had dreamt about. He then stood beside the rock and looked back at his new home. And that is when he realized that he was standing on the exact spot and staring at the exact house that he'd been dreaming about since he was a child. Reginald's family says the skill and hard work that went into restoring the home by their father is astonishing. Reginald was a tailor by trade and had no carpentry or renovation experience of any kind. He simply trained himself as he went along, but somehow had such a connection to the home that he seemed to just know how the home originally looked based purely on instinct. And this was before the days of the internet or YouTube, before anybody can look up a how-to video. He would work all day as a tailor and then come home and work on the house at night, mostly only by candlelight and gas lamps. Years later, after restoring most of the property, 
Reginald had the idea of building a ballroom out back. To build his ballroom, Reginald had used recycled bricks from a few older buildings that had been demolished in town. The number of bricks he obtained from these demolished buildings was the exact number of bricks he needed to build the ballroom. One day after the ballroom was completed, one of the visitors to the home happened to be one of the original maids employed by Mr. and Mrs. Crawley. She was one of the last members of staff to have ever worked for them. Upon learning this, of course, Reginald was very excited to talk to her and to gain as much information as he possibly could about the homestead. And she was overall very impressed on the restoration of the home. But it was when she went out back and saw the ballroom that she gasped in amazement and said, you rebuilt the ballroom. And it was then, apparently, that Reginald learnt that there was once a ballroom in the exact same location, only it was built from timber and metal. And this once was a very popular place for dancing and socialising in Junee. Also, not only had he rebuilt the ballroom in the exact same location, but according to her, the dimensions of the ballroom were the exact same, even down to where he placed the doors and windows. Reginald swears to have no knowledge of the original ballroom or to have even seen any pictures of one. And up until then, he had never heard anyone mention anything about a ballroom in Juni. One thing that I can't help but wonder is the fact that Mr. Crawley once owned half the town and the Monte Cristo was his pride and joy. The buildings in which these recycled bricks came from, were they once owned by Mr. Crawley? Is there some kind of spiritual connection here between Reginald and the spirits of the Monte Cristo? Did they handpick him from a young age and implanted those dreams into his head? The ballroom is still used today and the Ryans have been hosting the Monte Cristo Ball annually since 1973. Now, amongst the many strange and supernatural occurrences the Ryans have experienced inside their home, nothing has been as disturbing or as gruesome as the deaths of their pets. After moving into the home, the Ryans struggled to keep any cats on the property as they all went mad and ran away. One cat, however, had a litter of kittens. They had the litter sleeping in the kitchen and one morning they awoke to find all the kittens dead and mutilated on the kitchen floor. All entrances into the home were locked and they could not find any evidence of a forced entry. Later, Reginald decided to buy some laying hens and keep them in the backyard. A few days later, when he went to go check on them, he found them all dead in their cages, with no obvious cause of what killed them. So he made a much larger and safer enclosure that no one could enter without the key to the padlock, and he bought a few more hens. This time, Ryan also included the family's pet Galar to keep the hens company. Three days later, he found all hens and Galar dead with their necks broken. There was no sign of any animal or human entering the enclosure and there were no marks on their bodies like you might expect if they were attacked by a predator. One experience the family still can't get their head around is the time the family had left the house and gone into town for the day. They returned to the house later that evening. It was night now and the house was obviously dark. At this point in time, the house still had no electricity and the only light source came from candles and gas lamps. But when the family returned home, they found light pouring out of every single window and beaming across the field. It was described by then as very, very incredibly bright and there is no way that a candle or a gas lamp would do it and even with electrical lighting it would have had to be very 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 strong and as soon as the car passed the gates all lights went out all at once reginald's wife olive has said that she's once felt a hand on her shoulder when she was alone her name being called and footsteps walking around the top balcony when she was home alone 
One of those times when she heard footsteps on the balcony was actually when they first moved into the home and all the timber on the top balcony had actually almost completely rotted away. And what was left was too weak to hold the weight of any person. Yet she still heard footsteps of somebody walking up and down the upstairs balcony. Their youngest son, Lawrence, who was born after the family had moved into the homestead, says growing up, he always felt as though someone was watching him in their home. One night when his parents were hosting one of their famous balls, Lawrence was asleep in his bedroom. His elder sister went in to check on him and said she saw a man standing at the end of his bed, staring at him, looking very angry. His presence frightened her and she ran to tell her parents that a man was in the house. Reginald and Olive searched the whole house and property, but couldn't find anyone matching his appearance. Later, the family consulted mediums who told the family it was actually the spirit of Mr. Crawley himself. Olive used to say that the house frightened her too much to ever live there alone without her husband. So when Reginald passed away in 2014, she moved out into another house down in the main town of Juni. But she soon returned because she said there was just so much of her husband in the Monte Cristo. She says she feels closer to him while she's there and she believes that he is looking out for her. Lawrence, the youngest child of the Ryan clan, is now the primary caretaker of the house and he lives there with his wife, Sophia. Sophia believes that she had a past life in the house where she was possibly a maid. And they both take part in the guided tours and annual ball the family still hosts today. Today, you can still visit the homestead and if you wish, you can even stay a night. Many visitors believe that they have captured apparitions in their photos in and around the property. Uh, most popular place of all is actually the mirrors inside the homestead. That's where people say they've captured most apparitions. One of Reginald's theories for why the house is so haunted, which I actually think makes a bit of sense, is that he believes that underneath the house, there's a lot of quartz. And this is because there are many mineral mines in the area. Quartz is believed to be a magnifier of energy, and this could be contributing to so many of the active hauntings. And if you give into grid theory or sacred geometry, Soul Searchers and Australian Paranormal Investigation Team found that the main homestead lines up exactly with the Hartman grid lines running east to west. Now, if you're interested in looking any more into the Monte Cristo yourself, I suggest that you go over to Team WSPR's YouTube channel and watch their two-part investigation and podcast they did with the help of Lawrence Ryan. I have no affiliation with the team. I just found their two-part series to be really helpful for making this video and it was incredibly interesting. And you also get to see many in interviews with Lawrence Ryan himself. I'll have it linked below. Also, if you like scary movies, there was actually a horror thriller filmed at the homestead called Muir House. I haven't seen it, so if any of you have, I'd love to hear from you what you thought of it, or if you're going to, let me know. And of course, you can always go and visit the homestead yourself and stay a night if you wish. That's definitely on my bucket list. <laughs> I really like to hear from you down in the comment section. I'd love to hear what you thought of this video and especially if you have any other suggestions of cases that I can cover here on the Dark Down Under, whether it be another haunting case or true crime or a conspiracy theory or aliens in the outback, whatever you have, I'd love to hear from you, whatever can help me build my channel. Anything you would like me to cover here on the Dark Down Under, I'd love to know about it. So please either comment down below or you can reach me at my Twitter at dark underscore down underscore under. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss out on any more spooky Australian content. And I'll catch you later. See you in my next video. Bye. Of God. No, 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 it's not. No, it's not that. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. just scared the shit out of me. She just moved her head and scared the shit out of me. Harold's, Harold's chains
Harold's chain. Oh my God. Here enters Reginald Ryan. And then when he... Bleep, 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 bleep. 